Flip it, cuff it, check it. High blood pressure silently affects millions of Americans. Staying on top of your blood pressure is as simple as these four easy steps. Self-monitoring is power. Visit manageyourbp.org to learn more. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Lampa. I am the co-host of AM Buffalo, which airs live weekdays at 10 a.m. on Channel 7 WKBW. And I am so excited to be serving as your MC today for this Check It Community Conversation. Something you should know about me, I am so very passionate about the American Heart Association and their services and programs that whenever they ask, I am there for it. In my 20 years in the business, I've worked with them in some capacity all over the country. And so on a personal note, as soon as we are done here with this community conversation, I am going to get my blood pressure checked, something I'm hoping you'll do as well. The annual Check It Challenge is a free evidence-based wellness and blood pressure management program that focuses on improving your health by making simple changes to prevent and manage high blood pressure. It is not too late to sign up. Tell your employer or other friends and family members to learn more and sign up to take the challenge at www.heart.org forward slash check it NY. All right. Now, the Check It Challenge is proudly sponsored by Matthews Auto, Broadview Federal Credit Union, Baxter, the Kinney Drugs Foundation, and media sponsor CNY Latino. Now, a little bit of housekeeping. To ask questions today, you will need to use the chat box. Make sure you select all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your questions. Now, let's give it a try right now. Make sure you have all of our, your settings correct. In the chat box, go ahead, if you could, introduce yourself and let us know your name, where you are joining from, and what organization you are with. While our panelists, of course, are speaking, feel free to put your questions right there in that chat box and we will hold questions and get through as many as we can during our Q&A at the very end. And as a reminder, this is a public event. Please avoid disclosing any personal medical information when using that chat feature. Now, we are recording this session today and it will be available on the Check It Challenge website, American Heart Association, New York State Facebook event page, and the American Heart Association's Eastern States YouTube channel approximately two days after this webinar closes. Your registration from today will give you access to all recordings, future events, and resources on the event website. Of course, that is www.heart.org forward slash check it NY. If you are using social media throughout this conversation, please, please, please use the handles you see on the screen at AHA New York, again, at AHA New York spelled out and hashtag check it. We are so glad that you are joining us for the second webinar in the Check It Community Conversation Series, How to Eat Better and Manage Health. This is such a great topic because we are celebrating National Nutrition Month right now. And who doesn't love food? Yes, our first speaker today is Rachel Laster. Rachel is a registered dietitian and program director of the Nutrition Empowerment Program at DUville University. She joined DUville University in April 2021 and is a 2020 graduate of the DUville Dietetics Program. Rachel has extensive experience as a data analyst and community outreach coordinator for various healthcare agencies in the Buffalo community, and she has worked in the field for over a decade. She is active in the Western New York Dietetic Association, as well as the National Organization of Blacks in Dietetics through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Rachel also serves as a board member of Feed Buffalo. So Rachel, thank you so much for joining us and happy National Nutrition Month 
balance, quote unquote, is the latest word on healthy, heart healthy eating, according to the American Heart Association's, Association's scientific statement that encourages people to adapt to broad eating habits instead of focusing on single foods. And it's not one size fits all. You've prepared a little cooking demonstration for us. What are we about to watch? Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, yes, yeah, so the cooking demonstration is a berry balsamic and basil um, salad that is very heart healthy and very diabetic friendly um, and a good uh, salad to create if you're wanting to celebrate uh, National Nutrition Month with us this year. Okay, so we want to be able to show that demonstration. So we, there is a brief video, correct? Yeah. Yeah, All right. Right now, I think they're going to show a video. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, today, we're going to demo for you in the beautiful English kitchen um, here at the Duval Hub. And we will be making a strawberry and blueberry fruit salad that is very heart healthy and diabetes friendly. In my experience um, working in the community, I have given it to kids, I've given it to adults, and everyone seems to like it. So that's why I'm demoing it here today for you. Our ingredients are very simple. We have strawberries, blueberries, basil, and arugula, honey, and balsamic vinegar. So this recipe is particularly good for um, your diet as it, it includes fresh vegetables, fresh fruit and um, also is you can add um, healthy proteins and vitamins to it just very simply and it still be a very delicious salad. So um, right now I'm cutting up some tomato strawberries because that's really the only thing that needs to be cut this in the basil. Um, so I'm just chopping those into halves and then chopping that into like smaller mince pieces as you can see. But you can really do this to the, you know, the way you want it. If you want it really small, you can cut it really small. If you want it bigger or chunky, I guess you could cut the pieces larger. I just like to get them pretty much the same size as the blueberries I'm using so that when eating it, it's, you know, you can get all the good stuff in one bite. And as a note, this fruit was washed prior. We should always wash our fruit because, you know, it keeps it nice and safe that way. So to not belabor you watching me chop strawberries for minutes and minutes on end, I will now move on to the basil. I'm also gonna go rinse off, so I'll be right back. Hello, back with that basil. Okay, so um, the way to prep your basil for the salad is to remove it from the stem, and then uh, we'll talk about chiffonading in a second. Now, fresh herbs are a great way to make less spectacular food taste delicious. <laughs> so if you're not, if you don't feel you are an accomplished chef or home cook or whatever you want to consider yourself, try just adding fresh herbs to your food if you have access to them. They're a, be they're a great way to um, easily make your food taste better if you don't feel that you're good at doing that your own. So then you would take your um, basil and sort of lay it out in leaf and then roll those up, like roll that up real easy, like that, and chop it on up like this, like so. You get nice little strips of basil. This really makes the salad taste very bright, and it adds like a flavor level that wouldn't really exist otherwise. So it's a great way to make the salad that already would taste good without the basil, taste even better. So you just throw that basil in the bowl as well. And we'll chop up some more. Now we're done chopping um, more basil. And that's just because, because I'm making this and I like it. But you can add as much basil to the salad as you like. Uh, there's no required amount. This is also why it's a great salad to make because you can make it to your preferences and not um, necessarily a recipe's preference. So the blueberries you can just add, I would say maybe a cup or so to your bowl. And this is really the end of the prep almost just add some blueberries 
and then add about a tablespoon of balsamic vinegar. Now, vinegar has also been proven to help um, lessen blood sugar spikes. So this is a great salad to have before you eat, as that will help slow the blood sugar spike that you will um, experience from just eating food. That's what occurs after you eat food. So that this is an excellent salad to have prior to eating or to just eat in conjunction with other foods that may have carbohydrate if you are concerned about your carbohydrate and blood level sugars. So we're just gonna mix this up real quick. And look how bright and pretty it is. Like it's a really fun salad. Now, at this point you can taste it and see if you like it. Now, if you have really fresh, sweet fruit, you may not need to add any honey and this can be the way you serve it. And this would probably be the best way to serve it if you were looking to lessen your sugar intake. Um, berries are our um, best fruit to have if we're you know, consider concerned about that. But uh, a little bit of honey probably won't kill you. So I'm going to add just a little squirt of it, not even a tablespoon. And at this point, you would also potentially want to taste it and see if it's sweet enough to your preferences. Um, but berries are the best fruit to eat, especially if you are, um, if you are diabetic, not especially if you're diabetic. Um, and really, no fruit is bad for you. It's really just quantity. So I don't. I try to never um, suggest that people not eat fruit. That's not <laughs> that's not a healthy diet. Like fruit can be in your diet. It's th there's place for all things in a healthy diet. Just quantity and frequency is really what you need to be concerned about. But this is really the first step to the salad. So if you like it this way, you can just eat it this way. I've given it out, like I said, at several community events, adults, children, everyone likes it. People like the salad. However, if you want something a little more hearty and more meal-like, that's when you would add the arugula. Um, or whatever really mixed lettuce you like, like whatever mixed green lettuce you like. I wouldn't suggest a lighter lettuce like a romaine or a iceberg as it won't really taste probably great with these ingredients. It won't really flow with those. But mixed green and maybe like an artesian butter lettuce or something like that. Anything darker. This is also a stage at which you could store it. I wouldn't suggest you store it with any lettuce in it as that lettuce will wilt very quickly. This part will just continue to macerate and get like sweeter and more, uh, I guess, flavorful over time. Uh, this, the arugula wouldn't add to that. So I wouldn't suggest you mix, like if you wanna store it, I would store it in this state. It'll probably last about one to two days. This is like one, two, maybe three days max. I wouldn't suggest you try to do it too much longer than that as, you know, just to get a little less spectacular over time. So in, if you want to turn into a salad, all you have to do is simply add lettuce to a bowl or you know, in this case, arugula. Arugula is my favorite lettuce of sorts. So that's why I'm using that today. But you could use spinach, as I said, or really any dark lettuce would probably taste fine with this. You just mix that on up. And eventually this will cause the arugula to wilt a bit, the um, juice and stuff from the lettuce and the you know acid from the vinegar. But um, this will be a very healthy salad still to have. Um, arugula has a, a high content of nutrients. And that will be your nice berry and arugula salad. And even a way, a way to even pump this salad up a bit would add some salmon, which we have, which is full of good omega-3s. You could also use something also equally healthy as a maybe a grilled chicken breast. Um, if you wanted to add a meat source to increase the health of your, the health content of your food. Um, and also, if you uh, wanted to add in a vegan version of some higher protein, you could add some nuts, like any any nut, almonds, walnuts. Um, those would be a good source of omega-3s as well as other nutrients. So I hope you enjoyed our food demo today, and we can discuss more about it in our chat. Rachel, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I know there are plenty of people out there who are drooling. It is lunchtime. <laughs> it, it that is was lunchtime. a beautiful salad. I heard from a couple folks in the chat who said that was beautiful. And I'm sure it tastes just as wonderful. It, it's a very, it does, um, as I said, um, I've given out at several events and even children like it. Um, and I usually don't serve it with arugula. I usually serve the berry part. 
Um, but it's the basil really adds a really nice flavor and it's just a really easy salad to make. Anyone can do it. You can do it with your kids. Um, and it's, it, 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 it keeps a little well. It's a very just um, uh, useful salad and it's also very functional. It's a, it, it provides a good source of fiber. It's also sweet. So it's like it gives a good flavor while also providing just being good and healthy for you. So it's, it has both of those great qualities to it. You said two things that stuck with me. Mm -hmm. Easy and your kids will love it. <laughs> yes, kids actually like it. I was surprised because I was like, vinegar, will kids like it? I don't know. And they, they're, they, uh, they're always a fan usually, it's surprising. Yes, okay, so here's the thing. When it comes to healthy eating, I mean, that salad spoke for itself, but how do you usually get people started as a registered dietitian? Well, for as registered dietitians, we um, are trained to work with people who have uh, specific, um, optimal nutrition needs. So we try to help people get optimal nutrition when facing injury or disease states. And we usually work in hospitals. However, um, counseling with a dietitian is integral to helping people with chronic diseases. We have several research studies that show that if you do have a chronic disease such as diabetes, kidney failure, heart failure, working with a dietitian helps you um, manage your disease state much better because we can help guide um, those individuals on how to eat a better and more balanced diet toward their actual condition. Um, so when working with a dietitian, uh, we suggest that, you know, uh, we give specific suggestions in regards to your disease state. So if you're a diabetic, we'll help you work on your, your carbohydrate issue. Um, if you're uh, someone with chronic heart failure, we would probably help you consider what meals you should eat and how your salt content, fat content, things of that nature, and just guide in a better direction towards what you might want to eat considering your disease state. Sure. And so just a person that you know wants to eat healthier, we can help with that as well. Oh, I love that. Yes, for sure. Because we can all be a little bit healthier, right? There's always something Probably. we can in general. The only things I've um I will the um in general, I don't try to say that there's no one fit size fits all thing for all of this. Um, as we said earlier and thing, it's all really about balance and varied eating. So the the healthiest diet pattern for one person is not going to be the healthiest thing for the next person due to needs and due to diet and food preferences. Like people, some people like to eat certain things, some people don't like to eat other things. So you can't say that one thing is going to fit everyone. The only advice I truly try to give that say is across the board, probably accurate, is to drink more water, like drink water and <laughs> probably eat some more vegetables because most people don't do those two things. But generally across the board, um, it, it's a very one-on-one -on -one thing. It's a very personal thing. So working with everyone at where they're at and then helping them find what works best for them is really what dietitians try to do when working with an individual to help them increase their overall health. You mentioned something just in answering that question, what a healthy eating pattern is. You said it varies for each person. Can you explain what a healthy eating pattern is generally? Yes. Yeah, so, so that's what I'm saying. So generally, uh, it's, it's different for each person. So we try to suggest that it be balanced and varied. So we want it to consist of all your macronutrients. So basically, it has to consist of protein, fat, and carbs in the, in the proper quantities. And that's going to be different for each person based on where they're at health-wise. But generally, um, we would ask that you get about 50% from good carbohydrate sources like whole grains um, and uh, your... Um, like not as so much refined sugars and like processed foods. Um, we would then like you to you know, seek out protein from pretty much any source that you would like to seek it from. There's animal-based protein, there's plant-based protein. And, we, and you do need some fat in your diet, not too much saturated fat. We ask that you sort of maybe peel that back to about 10% uh, of your total calorie intake a day, but that you, know, you can get in a good source of healthy fats from your products like avocados, olive oil, nuts, things of that nature and lean away maybe from your more saturated, not that you shouldn't have any, because we really, <laughs> as the dietitians, we don't want people to completely limit what they're eating or like um, re completely restrict any macronutrient. Um, but we do want people to consider what they're eating. So like lessen on the saturated fat, because we have, you know, evidence that shows um, that to a diet too high in saturated fat will lead, you know, to heart issues. And so we don't want that. So, mm. the, you know, lessen the cheese, but you can have cheese, but, you know, consider how much cheese, because I'll eat cheese three times a day if you let me, <laughs> but I know better. Me too. <laughs> I, like, I, like, I, like, I like cheese a lot. Butter is a wonderful thing. And we know it's not as evil as it was. We still don't want to have food completely laden in butter. So, um, you know, just figuring out different ways. I am a someone who likes to cook. So I often try to prepare recipes 
um, that are common things that people like to eat in a healthier way. So uh, trying to figure out how you can maybe take a calorie out here and add something better in there, add some flavor points here, add spices here instead of salt, you know, things of that nature so that you can have healthier food that still tastes good. Because if people don't, it, it can be healthy, but if no one wants to eat it, it's not gonna really work. Oh my gosh, it's so great that you mentioned that because my next question really was just that. Mm-hmm. How can we get more fruits and vegetables in our diets? I, there's got to be tips and tricks. And as a registered dietitian, I'm sure you've got something up your sleeve. I have a couple. Um, personally, what I like to do is add cauliflower rice to certain things. So we often have an issue in America because we eat too much with the volume. So uh, we often want a lot more food than we probably should eat at one given time. <laughs> and that's just how we are. Unfortunately, it's how we set ourselves up. We probably should work on that as a collective, but we, and we may. But um, we embrace the bounty for sure. <laughs> yes, we do. So um, uh, I often try to mix in cauliflower rice with other dishes. So if there's like rice in my food, I'll mix, I'll, be like, I'll do like half a cup of rice and half a cup of cauliflower rice. And that'll help add a vegetable in, which we need more vegetables because it has more fiber. Um, and uh, you know more nutrients than uh, not not to say that rice has no nutrients. Rice is fine, but it's just better to have more vegetables in your diet. They're the the best source of nutrients that we have, um, and uh, they are nice and low calorie. They're just good for you, and we don't eat enough of them. That's what we, we we don't eat enough of them. So I mix that into things like rice or grits or um, some other type of dish that I feel needs more bulk. Um, also, if you have like children or if you're just a person yourself and you want to sneak some vegetables in, they go, they hide very well in smoothies. So you can make a fruit smoothie with like spinach or zucchini. I find both those vegetables to be good vegetables to that hide. Like you can, you don't really taste them as much inside of a, inside of a smoothie or something. Um, also a good way to, if you're not a vegetable fan, a good way to make yourself one is to roast your vegetables as opposed to maybe boiling them. Like roasted asparagus, roasted Brussels sprouts, roasted, um, roasted potatoes and zucchini all these things they're all all those vegetables taste significantly better roasted than boiled so um well let's maybe potatoes potatoes taste good no matter how you cook them but <laughs> <laughs> so, true. Like, so true but other vegetables um so if you want to roast your vegetables that's also an excellent way to um not increase the uh because you, you have to usually roast those in, in some degree of olive oil so you like coat them in olive oil but it's still much healthier than um not having the vegetable firstly, and then uh, um, it provides a really good flavor to them that you otherwise will not get. I, I'm not a fan of boiled Brussels sprouts. I won't eat those, but if you roast one, I'll eat lots of them. So that's good ways to try to increase uh, your vegetable intake. I do know I also love a, a roasted Brussels sprout. And you just taught me something. I put a lot of things in smoothies, but that zucchini tip, Oh yes. my goodness, I'm using that frozen when I go home. Frozen zucchini is very good. I mean, it doesn't have to be frozen, but frozen, you know, it lends to a better texture. Um, so yes, it, I, I didn't, I, I just did it one day and I was like, hmm, you can't taste it at all. It's very, oh. it hides very well. Um, certain ones don't hide. Like, mm, I've heard of people doing fruit and cucumbers. That's not so bad. It's kind of refreshing, but it's, you can still sort of taste the cucumber. I really wouldn't suggest, um, uh, I've heard of cauliflower, but I tried it and I didn't love it. So, uh, you mean, everyone should try anything, but some things I've noticed work better than other things. So here's the thing. You just mentioned a tip, like buying frozen or freezing your zucchini before you stick it in the smoothie. What are other smart shopping tips while you're out in the grocery store and you're trying to be healthy, yes. what do you have to say to folks I definitely who are suggest, um, and people um, often think that frozen vegetables are less healthy than um, are, than fresh. And that could possibly be the case, but it's not necessarily the case because we don't necessarily know where our supermarket food came from, how far it shipped, how long it was, how long it was picked. Frozen food, uh, frozen vegetables, however, are usually picked and then re- and then frozen right away. So they sometimes can even have a higher nutrient content because they haven't been sitting around as long than um, some of the food we find in our grocery mart and our grocery stores. Um, so frozen fruit and vegetables are good things to always have on hand, so you can just easily make something, uh, easily have a vegetable to throw in your food. Um, same with, uh, but I would say the best way to be a smart shopper is to, if you have the time, unfortunately, plan ahead to plan what you are truly, or what you're planning to cook, to plan what you're, so you can purchase the right things and not just be like sort of impulse shopper and buy a series of things that really won't necessarily be beneficial to you. And also, um, uh, can, it can, if you do plan, you can often have some cost savings that occurs because you're being more cognizant of what you're purchasing. And that could be very helpful, especially if someone is trying to look, learn how to like maybe budget. And, you know, we had a, a you know, situation just a couple months where eggs were $5, 
a dozen for several weeks. Like, um, so money has to stretch. And so the best way to stretch them, because people often think that healthy eating is more expensive and it can be, but it does not have to be, especially if you are planning and you consider what you're purchasing, like a bag of chips is like about $4. And if you don't buy that bag of chips and you buy, or, or you plan how often you're going to eat that bag of chips, like if you like portion it out, it can be more cost efficient than if you're just buying things all willy nilly and not really considering what you're purchasing. And also like leaning on maybe some more vegetarian cooking because that can be a lot more um, cost efficient than meat purchasing. Meat is a very expensive product in comparison. And if you like maybe do a, like a meatless Monday and instead of using beef to make tacos, you use um, some type of maybe a chickpea type taco or something or tofu taco, you can, that tofu is very cheap in comparison by, uh, by weight in comparison to meat. So yeah. things of that nature, if you choose to like maybe adopt some vegetarian practices in eating, you may be able to save some money on that front as well. Oh my gosh, Rachel, you have mm-hmm. totally changed the way I think about shopping and yeah. eating. So thank you so much, Rachel. We appreciate you. Really mm-hmm. great information. If you have questions for Rachel, just remember, make sure you put them in the chat box so it's visible to everyone in our Q&A session. And we will make sure that we address those questions later. And as we move to our next panelist, Dr. Greg Garrity, diabetes, metabolism, and endocrinologist specialist at Albany Med Health System. Dr. Garrity, thank you so much for being with us. After graduating Phi Phi Theta Kappa, excuse me, from the University of Vermont, Dr. Garrity went to medical school at the Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse, New York. He trained in internal medicine here in Albany and had completed fellowship training in endocrinology at Yale in 1988. Board certified in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism, he is a past president of the American Diabetes Association, New York State Affiliate. Dr. Garrity is particularly interested in management of patients with diabetes and those with metabolic bone disease, such as osteoporosis. Now, he is the founder of the Endocrine Group Tour to Cure team, which rides every June to raise money to help find a cure for diabetes. When he is not in the office, Dr. Greg loves to be with his family of four children riding his bike or skiing. Dr. Garrity, wonderful to have you here today. Rachel just gave us amazing overview of a healthy eating pattern. And as I look through all of the controlling um, health factors on the Life's Essential 8 website, blood pressure, cholesterol, blood pressure, uh, blood sugar, excuse me, they all have eating smart on the top of the list for things. What would he do to improve our numbers? Why is diet so important to managing our health? Well, first of all, thank you, Emily, for asking. And second of all, I just want to compliment Rachel on a beautiful job and uh, making me salivate and hungry. And <laughs> I, I can create something like that at dinner time tonight with my wife's help, who is of course a big help. But to get back to your question, Emily, why is diet so important? So if you think about it, we really are truly what we eat. I know it's a, it's a phrase, but in a sense, what we eat, the type of foods we eat and how much we eat can define us. And that can be very good and it can be very bad as well. So in my world, I'm an endocrinologist and I see a lot of folks with diabetes, in particular type 2 diabetes. So just a few statistics, 34 million people with diabetes in this country. Um, 90% of those have type 2 diabetes. And the majority of those, maybe 90%, are dealing with weight issues, either they're uh, obese or they're you know, overweight. So these are very serious problems for, that I deal with every day. And the other problem we see is that there's a phrase in diabetes care which says that diabetes equals heart disease. So they're equivalent. And the reason for that is folks with diabetes like myself and many of the patients I care for have the same risk of a heart attack as a person without diabetes who has already had a heart attack. So it's important that we manage what we call the ABCs. So the A is the hemoglobin A1C. That's our glucose control. We wanna do our best to manage that, keep it close to normal without going too low and certainly avoiding the extreme highs as well. The B is really the focus of this seminar and that is blood pressure. So we wanna control the hemoglobin A1C or glucose the blood pressure, and then finally, the cholesterol. 
And if we can manage those three measures, endpoints, if you will, we will significantly reduce our risk for a heart attack and stroke. Now, the truth is we can't change our genetic makeup. And some of this may define who we are. In other words, we may be genetically predisposed towards obesity, hypertension, high cholesterol, and even heart disease. We can't change that. We can't change our genes, but what we can change is our nurture or our environment. So these are things we can reach out and change. And we do this largely through diet and exercise. 60% of adults in this country are overweight or obese. So we have a lot of work to do. And this extra weight increases the risk for diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, heart disease, arthritis, cancer, and other risk factors. So a focus in my world is on, for people with type two diabetes in particular, is reducing their weight. Now, um, we just finished talking about that. Rachel did a nice job talking about that. And I'm gonna add my two cents here, uh, you know, towards this as well. So for weight loss, when we lose weight, we reduce the risk of these endpoints, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, cholesterol. And from my perspective, one of the keys to weight loss is reducing the calories. Now, there are many different ways to do this, um, but whatever diet one chooses to follow, and they all work, but some may be better than others, as Rachel alluded to, uh, I think it's important to reduce your caloric intake. So that means, in a sense, you start counting calories. If you're used to you know, consuming 2,500 calories a day and you're gaining weight, then you've got to cut back. And I think you have to be very conscientious. Not I think, or I, I think I am when you're snacking in between, but you really have to pay attention to what you're eating, which many folks don't do because we are creatures of habit, myself included. So if I want to lose weight, I've got to pay attention to that. Some diets are healthier than others. I think Rachel would probably agree that the Mediterranean diet is probably very heart healthy. But when it comes to weight loss, even the Atkins diet, people lost weight. And at first glance, high fat diet, people lost weight and their cholesterol improved, their sugars improved. So the most important endpoint is losing weight. Some diets may be healthier than others. And I think I should make a point of saying this as well. Remember ABCs, weight loss translates to lower A1C, lower glucose, B, blood pressure. Weight loss also contributes to lower <laughs> blood pressure. In addition, part of the diet is reduce the salt intake. Reduce, you know, recondition those taste buds to going without salt or use some of these other very nice spices that are available, which don't contain salt. I, you know, I can't possibly do what Rachel does, but I do know that there are alternatives to table salt that we ought to explore. And then finally, you know, this is a lot to ask of anyone on their own. So we have a team of people that help us, you know, individuals like Rachel, your physician, your primary care physician, certainly family members who want to engage them to help us on this road to improvement. And then sometimes, even despite our best efforts, uh, we are still challenged with this because this is a, this is a big ask of any, anybody. So when that's not enough and these measures aren't effective, then we have medications we use. We have medications to lower the blood glucose. We have medications that lower the blood glucose without causing hypoglycemia. Medications that lower the blood glucose with weight loss. We have medications to lower the cholesterol and we have medications to reduce the weight. Well, taken together between the lifestyle changes, the diet, the family support, the medicines, as the weight comes down, as the blood pressure comes down, as the cholesterol improves, we reduce our risk for heart disease and related cardiovascular complications like stroke and congestive heart failure. From my perspective, bottom line is we've got to do our best to reduce the calories, to reduce the weight, and in so doing, improve the blood pressure, 
cholesterol and the A1C. And guess what else happens? We don't have to guess. Everyone listening knows this. When we lose weight, we feel good about ourselves. We get a positive affirmation. Everyone knows, should know they are good. But at times we struggle when with disappointment from you know, not being able to lose weight. So even sometimes five pounds can be reason enough to say, I really feel good about myself and I'm gonna keep this up. So I think that's also what comes, not only those hard metrics like the glucose and the blood pressure and the cholesterol, but a metric we don't measure enough and that sense of well-being. So I think that's something people can look forward to. It's hard work getting there, but people can look forward to it. Well, Dr. Garrity, that was fantastic. I have a question for you. Yes. If someone is struggling to manage these chronic conditions, which you brought up, um, what is one change that they can make? I mean, you mentioned so many things, but I'm wondering if you could just recommend something to those folks. Yeah, so that's an excellent point. Uh, so thank you for asking. Um, I think one change is a very good idea. So when I set out targets for patients, uh, I don't ask them to lose 20 pounds. I give them a reasonable, realistic target of five pounds. How do you do that? It can happen in several ways. You know, I think if we each look at our diet, we can say, well, maybe I don't need that ice cream at night. It can be that simple. It may be, maybe I don't need two servings, maybe just one serving will do. And at the outset, this is very difficult because it's breaking old habits. Mm -hmm. but once you get past the first couple of weeks, it becomes more routine and doable. So I think you start with small changes and build, you know, realize some success, you know, and uh, one change I like is just eating a little less, maybe not seconds, you know, maybe shrinking the portion size. And you're right. I think a simple change to start with is a nice way that you feel good about yourself. So Dr. Garrity, on that note, you know, being able to talk about portion size, it's tricky for some folks because if you're used to and accustomed to eating a certain amount, that is a big ask, but it's doable, right? It is definitely doable. Look, let me give you an example. You know, one example is I have to be mindful of my blood sugar. So uh, how do I manage my lunch? You know, because when we eat, our blood sugars go up. And so of course I measure my blood sugar. And if I overdo it, I know my sugar is gonna be high. So early on, you know, I would have whatever was being put in front of me. And I realized this is not going to work because <laughs> it's all delicious, but it's too much. So I have adapted over the years. I make my lunch now. So just a couple tips here. This is what I do. It's not for everybody, but I'll tell you what, it works. So- And that's actually quite great because the thing is, Having you tell people that, and you've seen a lot in your um, expertise and what you do. So on that note, since it is National Nutrition Month and we're talking about eating and how you can do better, what would you say is your favorite food that you make or you would advise people would be a good alternative perhaps if you're feeling a little snacky? All right, so I'm going to be very honest with you about my favorite food, and then I'll give you <laughs> a sample of my menu. For me, my favorite food is coffee and peanut butter and jelly. You know, mm, that I, sounds delicious. <laughs> it's delicious, and there's nothing better following a bike ride or a hike. So, generally, uh, that's one of my favorite foods. Yes, I love a good oatmeal raisin cookie also with coffee. So, you yeah, know, those are delicious. Um, so for my breakfast, I will have, I use the low calorie bread, 40 calorie per slice, not much. A slice of bread, you know, contain twice that much of calories. So I use that, I put peanut butter on it, I skip the butter and I'm good with my coffee. That's, you know, and a little soy creamer. So that's my breakfast, lunch, peanut butter and jelly on that 40 calorie bread with a banana and a Greek yogurt, 0% fat Greek yogurt. And yes, I'll have a cookie on board if I need that too, or if I want that. Uh, and then for dinner, I'm very fortunate that uh, my wife uh, cooks like Rachel. So she'll make a delicious salad like that. And it'll usually be maybe a, uh, you know, a grilled type of chicken in with the salad 
mushroom, squash, broccoli, all of that roasted, and then some fish and meat and a sweet treat for dessert, whatever is there, you know, but moderation, moderation. Something I also noticed, and I'm just going to put it out there because I talk to a lot of qualified, amazing dietitians, registered dietitians, just like Rachel. And what I noticed from what you were telling us about is that you're talking about your, your meals all had fiber and they all had protein, which I think, of course, is what you're trying to hint at, at those two things, especially since you were talking about losing weight being key. That's a great snack to have, correct? Oh, yeah. So that's a, that's a great call out, Emily, to notice that. So it's important for a lot of reasons. The glycemic index, so the glucose raising potential when there's fiber like that is much lower. Second of all, with lots of water, which Rachel talked about, it keeps our bowel habits regular, which everyone feels good about. (laughs) And it also contributes to a sense of fullness. Uh, In addition, it may help lower cholesterol. So, you know, these soluble fibers help to lower cholesterol. So there are a lot of positive features to, you know, making sure doing your best to see that that's integrated into the diet on a daily basis. And this is one of the biggest challenges. We may start out gung-ho, like many of us do, every January 1st, but the key to success is maintaining that, and that can be hard. So keep at it. It can be hard. And, you know, keep at it. Weight loss comes slowly, but it does come if you continue. And, you know, when diet alone isn't enough, get out there and go for a walk. Pretty soon, this tundra is going to disappear and we'll, (laughs) you know, we'll be able to walk safely outside in warm sunshine. And what's better than that for our mental health, which is an important part of, you know, total health as well. That is a very good point. I am super excited that at least here in Western New York, it is 50 degrees today. So I'll take that. That feels balmy for me. I don't know about you, but I'm happy here. It does feel balmy and we'll take it. It's been a long time. That is all very good points. And I will say that in the chat, we heard from Rachel. She was saying, to your point, consistency is key. Just trying to be consistent is probably hard, but it's really what we're striving for, correct? Oh, absolutely. You know, and this is a challenge, but we get into habits. And the hardest part at the outset is changing our not so good habits, you know, to better habits. And it's hard. Change is hard. But if you keep at it, that becomes a new habit. And then when you sort of get off the bandwagon, you notice, let me get back to my better way of doing things. It's doable. It's hard at the outset, which is why we have people like yourself and Rachel, you know, and the people at the ADA and the American Heart Association and family to help us, to support us, because this is really a lifelong endeavor. And pretty soon, those people who have made the change have learned, and they start helping other people. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I'm so glad that you, as a medical professional, is speaking to the folks out there, because the one thing I wanted to ask you about is you brought up blood pressure, uh, as well as, of course, diabetes. But how important is it, and you mentioned this uh, earlier, is it that you make sure you're getting checked? Because the check a challenge is something that, of course, the American Heart Association stands behind and they push, but how important is it for you to do your due due diligence, get your blood pressure checked regularly? It's an excellent question, Um, Emily. So I think it's very important. You know, we're not so bad here. You know, it's, (laughs) there's no need to be afraid. We are here to help. And I think it's important that you find a caregiver that you can talk to that you can, you know, that can check your blood pressure, that can check your weight, and that you can feel comfortable with. You know, this doesn't have to be a Nobel laureate. It just has to be someone that takes a personal interest in your health. And they are out there. They are out there. But they can't help you unless you get to them. 
It's a very good point. Dr. Garrity, thank you. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for your insight. I think it's been really helpful for me. I can speak for myself and I'm sure for the folks who are with us here in this webinar. Now, a reminder for our audience, those who are watching, if you put your questions in the chat box, we will try to get to as many of them as we can this morning. So right now we're gonna ask Rachel if she can join us back on screen for that Q&A. So Rachel, you there? Yes. Hi, <laughs> welcome, welcome back. And I do love that you're so very active on the chat box because yeah, and I that was trying to answer some of the questions. <laughs> it was so good. It was so good. So here we go. It is time to ask some of those questions, and we have some very helpful folks from the American Heart Association who are standing by, who have been monitoring the chat box, and some of the questions you might have asked already or answered already rather Rachel but we're going to ask those questions again just so that you can answer it um over the video so oh, if our friends want to go ahead and weigh in so yes we uh, did have uh, the question that Rachel asked, answered in the chat box was how much water should you drink in a day and to throw in a related question since Rachel did answer that in the chat box we also just got another one does flavored water like Macy or LaCroix count towards water intake or should we only count plain water? Um, since those are items that don't have a high sugar content, um, we do consider that though that pretty much counts towards your water intake. Also like broth or um, can count towards your water intake as well. Like if you're drinking like a soup that's high in like a, a literally brothy soup, that's what it can count toward it. It does sometimes, it often can be salty though, so we don't want to count it too much if there's too much salt involved, but it gets a little it gets a little fuzzy. It does. I promise you. Some people count coffee, some people say don't count coffee. I'm it, so it really matters which dietitian you're talking to and their opinion on that in some aspects. However, it's generally that um if there's no other additive in it like a sugar like like sugar or if it's clearly not like if you it, we sort of base it on if it's like a sugared beverage or not. So if there's a lot of sugar, we say it probably should not count towards your daily water intake. And if there is, um, if, there, if there is like a lot of sugar, then like, you know, if you're having like a caramel macchiato, that's probably not, that's not water, you know? So that's not that you shouldn't drink. <laughs> You shouldn't count that towards your liquid intake over time. But like, if it's just a brothy soup that doesn't have a high salt content, that's probably okay. As well as um, you can consider some of the water intake from like, if you have a very high, um, like, uh, that water vegetable like cucumber or melons or something like that you can sort of also count that but that's really only in the cases where someone usually has a water i mean a liquid restriction and we're like really trying to figure out how to get some water in them and figuring out different areas to get water um into their diet so but just yeah, so it, to your point i see i'm not sure what you're referring to if you're talking about slurpees no um but lacroix yes <laughs> uh so i was like but um yes those would count so i actually is? i think it's Interesting. I'm going to cut it real fast um, mm -hmm. just because you mentioned coffee and I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who are like me who love her coffee and yeah. uh, Dr. Garrity as well because he likes to have it with his snack. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so when we talk about coffee, I think it would be worthwhile for you to explain why coffee can be kind of tricky. Like Coffee's if you're drinking. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, yeah. So it's a little tricky because of the caffeine content that can be a little dehydrating, as well as, like I said, people take their coffee different ways. So um, some people add a lot of sugary creamer and like uh, a lot of like, there's no really issue in adding milk. It does take away some of the antioxidant effect of the coffee. I drink my oh. coffee black, but um, but not in a way that you really need to be concerned because to Mr. Gar Dr. Garrity's point earlier, there is like nutrition is nutrition and it's important, but there's also overall wellness and like enjoyment of life. And if you're not enjoying it, you're not going to like, you can't like, so if you want to have a little bit of sugar in your coffee, that's okay. If you're diabetic, you really might not want to, you might want to add a Splenda. You really might want to consider your overall health, your goals and your needs, and then make your decisions based on that. And like I said, like you said, initially it's very hard to make some of these changes. It's like you, it, you have to change your, um, but it's very small change. And over time, if you see the benefit, if you see the benefit, it often helps you want to continue the good, the, the good behavior. I don't want to, but I, I try not to vilify any behavior around eating because we really don't want people to have that and, um, you know, have like, you know, complexes around their eating. We just want people to enjoy their eating as well as understanding there are things you can do to, ben, to that'll be more beneficial for using other things. 
Um, I thought I, I thought that caffeine raises my blood pressure. It, yes, it's, it's, yes, that's what I'm saying. Like caffeine is a consideration, so you don't want to just go ca- all, like if you do have a blood con- a blood um, pressure situation, you do want to consider your caffeine intake um, and just accordingly for that. Um, someone said sugar level should be. Oh uh, well, I also um. Uh, okay. Go Can ahead. I jump in on the caffeine. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, I, I, some of this is self defense, but some of it's real science. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, coffee really has yet to been proven to be a problem. And there have been a zillion studies done. Now, some people, maybe if they're prone to a rapid heart rate, shouldn't be drinking too much coffee. There, they may want to moderate their coffee intake or drink decaffeinated coffee where there is still caffeine. But otherwise, I think, you know, we don't have to worry about that unless we're overdoing it. So I think if you're having two or three cups a day, you're probably fine. That's probably not a problem. Unless you're having trouble sleeping at night, then it may be a problem. Mm. But otherwise, I don't, if you're having too much and you have a systolic hypertension, again, this is too much. I'm not talking about two or three cups a day. Higher amounts may be prone to raise not, over your, not only your heart rate, but your systolic blood pressure, the top number. But again, that's, that's a lot of coffee. For most people, one, two, three cups a day, that's probably not too much, unless your doctor tells you otherwise. Yes, and, as you're saying, like, if, I'm, I'm not, like, I'm not, I don't vilify caffeine intake. It's pretty much, like you said, generally okay, unless you actually have an outline issue that makes it not okay for you. I personally just can't drink, I can't drink much coffee just because it makes me jittery. Like if I have more than one cup a day, I'm done. I'm like, oh no, bad, bad choice. But that's, that's just me and it's always been me. Like, but for everyone it's different. And like, as to Dr. Garrity's point, it, um, it's pretty much, if your doctor didn't say don't drink too much coffee, you could probably have enough, as much coffee, not as much coffee as you like, but you know, like two to three cups should not be a problem. Yeah, yeah. another and you- of caffeine that's often overlooked, but not in your world, Rachel, and that is drinking you know, Pepsi's and Coca-Cola, mm, yes. you know, and there, there are extra calories too. And, mm, yes. You know, uh, I, I, someone had asked uh, in the chat about sugar content of beverages. And I was going to say, uh, I would suggest you drink no sugar beverages if you can avoid it. Um, like there, now that is a point, And that's just a personal point now, because you know, the, there's a large, um, you know, push for everything in this place. And yes, everything in this place, but there really is no place for those beverages. Uh, and so I'm not, a pro- I don't promote drinking those and really for any reason, because they're really just not nutritionally sound. There's nothing there for you uh, outside of potential enjoyment, which I, I don't know. I've stopped drinking sugar beverages like like pop and Pepsis and things of that nature a, a while ago. I occasionally have juice and it's usually watered down um, only because well, the juice isn't as bad because that's just nutrients, at least something that, but sugar beverages have no extra nutrients. It's really like, unless you're, you know, maybe a diabetic and your blood sugar got too low somehow and you needed to, to save you, short of that, there's really not a lot of help it gives. And um, it does add extra calories that are not beneficial to your diet. So I really don't suggest that people drink sugar beverages, but if you must, I would say, I guess maybe about a can over the course of a day, <laughs> if you no. stretch it. That's just my opinion, though. That's what there's really no. We don't. Honestly, we have a study like that says this is the optimal amount of pop to drink, or you know, pop because we're from Buffalo or soda, wherever you're from. But um, yeah, there, I don't. There's no specific studies that I know of that say this is the amount of sugar you should drink a day because you really shouldn't necessarily drink a lot of your sugar if you can avoid it. It's really your overall sugar content. You want to watch how much sugar you're taking in. Rachel, another uh, sort of nice adventure substitute mm-hmm. for these drinks is particularly in the summertime is putting a slice of lemon in your ice cold water. Or yep. a slice of water. Oh, different flavored waters are an excellent thing. I like to actually make, uh, take this, I, I take cucumbers and I take the seeds out, the seeds and like the pop out the middle of the, cu- the cucumbers and I blend that up strain it and use that from to make cucumber water um that's it's it's like you know just an extra refreshing point to make you know to have your if you're getting bored with regular water something you can do to make your water a little bit more interesting so like lemon in your water you can uh, do fruit infused water if you have you know extra fruit laying around but i don't like to waste my fruit with my water so <laughs> so i don't <laughs> usually make that myself but um i do you like to use the you know scraps of my cucumbers in water Someone's made a nice comment here in the chat box about, you know, maybe needing more water if you're more physically active. And I, I think that's absolutely true, particularly 
in the summertime where you're going to sweat out more water. So again, in terms of advice, people should be drinking at least to satisfy their thirst, enough water to satisfy their thirst. And that's going to be more in the summertime when we're sweating out more and we're more physically active. Um, oh, yes, I see. I see the question. Yes, um, it's pretty like if you live somewhere that's hotter, you probably will need to drink more water, especially if you are outside and like, you know, Arizona running. Um, you're going to probably need more water than somebody currently in Buffalo not running because it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> Let's check back in with Christy Smorrell, who's standing by. Christy, did you see any other questions that you wanted to make sure that our panelists were able to address? I think we have time to get to one more question. What is the connection between cholesterol listed in nutrition facts and food labels and the cholesterol in our blood? Who would like to take that? Rachel, do you think you want to answer that first? Um, I've Sure, yes. Uh, so I'm sorry, though. Could, could she say the question again? I didn't get the entire question. <laughs> what is the connection between cholesterol listed in nutrition facts and the cholesterol listed in our, or cholesterol found in our blood. You know, we see cholesterol on the nutrition. Oh yes, factors. okay, so those are, I've been informed, and I, Dr. Gary can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that these are slightly different cholesterols and we don't need to um, be worried about as much as, as we have been previously, like the cholesterol like eggs or something. Uh, it's not the same cholesterol that is floating around in our bloodstreams. And that is more, the cholesterol, that cholesterol is it's beneficial cholesterol usually that's in our foods that um, we, unless you have a high cholesterol diagnosis and you want to watch it in that case, but short of that diagnosis, um, it's okay to have some cholesterol in your diet. It's okay to have those eggs. It's okay to have, you know, reasonable quantities of butter because usually this cholesterol is associated to a saturated fat problem and we know that that saturated fat is also is, is what causes the issue with your blood cholesterol so the the negative blood cholesterol the hdl the, the bad blood cholesterol that's going to be more from your saturated fats and we don't want that's why we, do, we want to keep that number low and your triglycerides lower so that we can um have you know not have that stuff floating around and causing the atherosclerosis and the um, vascular diseases that we do see. Uh, now, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Gary. I think I'm right on that. Um, but what I, I'd like to do is not correct you, but add to what you've okay. said, because I agree with what you've said, but I think it's important. There's a myth or misperception out there that mm -hmm. you know our cholesterol is high because we eat too much saturated fat, we eat too much cholesterol. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. Most of our cholesterol is determined genetically. So oh, okay. our genetically program, we make cholesterol. And by following a low fat, low cholesterol diet, we can impact that slightly, but not tremendously. So okay. oftentimes it's very frustrating. The patient comes in, they're following your diet to the T and they've lost weight also. They're even exercising more. And yet the cholesterol only comes down 10, 15%. Why? Because we make cholesterol. And when that's the case and our cholesterol remains above goal, and we talk about other ways to get at this, including medication. Medication. Yes, I have heard of people having a genetic disposition toward high cholesterol. I just. Yeah, most of the cholesterol you know, in our body. I didn't know exactly how that works. Genetic machinery. Yeah, from making cholesterol or under metabolizing it. The diet mm -hmm. influences it some, but a small amount. Yes. Dr. Greg Garrity, Rachel Laster, I just want to say thank you so much to both of you for your amazing input. We are so grateful to have you here as panelists on our Check It Conversation, community conversation that is, and to the sponsors that you see on the screen. We're gonna pop that up real quickly. Just, we can't say enough about being able to have these organizations support the Check It Challenge and making it possible. Thank you so much to all of you who joined us today because your registration from this event gives you access to previously recorded sessions as well as future webinars in this series. So we'd like to let you know the next Check It Community Conversation, how to be more active and manage weight will be on Wednesday, April 26th at 12 p.m. And of course, we hope to see all of you there. So on that note, keep checking your blood pressure and show us what you're cooking. What's, what's cooking <laughs> this month by tagging the American Heart Association at AHA New York again at AHA New York, spelled out. That's on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Use the hashtag, don't forget, hashtag, check it. That's it, check it 
All right. We hope you have a fantastic day and that you had so many takeaways from this fantastic conversation. Again, thank you to the panelists and thank you so much for being a part of it. Thank you, Emily. Th thank you.